Um, I'm going to share with you a, an unusual story of, um, of turning a vision, an idea, uh, a, a slightly crazy scheme that I hatched alongside a perfectly normal day job um, some years back. Uh, and I'm going to share with you how that grew into something more successful than we ever imagined. But I like, I like to keep things uh, fairly simple, although clickers usually are far from that, so we'll forget that. Uh, so if you, you can summarize the journey that we went on from really going from this to this by spending most of our time doing this. So yes, failing. So in other words, learning from failure, learning from you know, controlled failure. So none of the failures that we encountered deliberately were in any way uh, debilitating, either financially or physically. So if I take a step back and, and describe a bit where this came from, the starting vision was, could you approach the challenge of flight in an entirely different way from what has worked really quite well over the last 100 years by actually augmenting the human mind and body. Human, human beings uh, have got ridiculous capability, and if you train mind and body in a certain direction, it's amazing what you can achieve. You, I don't have to list all the different roles that humans can adopt from athletes to professors and everybody in between, but there's a huge you know, diversity of capability. And there's a nice little uh, showreel here of the guy I used to train with alongside my day job. I never managed to get quite to this level, but that's a, a training regime called calisthenics where you can train your body and your mind from a balance and strength point of view to achieve some quite amazing things. So that was part of the inspiration. And I wondered whether if you just added the right amount of technology in a minimalist kind of way, whether you could approach flight in, in that manner. So the, beyond, beyond the inspiration of the human mind and body, we needed some of that minimalist technology. And the point we went to was micro gas turbines. So in other words, little baby jet engines. And these jet engines work almost identically to the type you have on a jet fighter or a civil airliner. And they're special because they, whilst consume a huge amount of fuel, they put out a massive amount of power given their size and scale. So our ground zero was this point. And just for the AV guys, you probably want to just turn the sound down a bit. It'll get really annoying otherwise. This, this isn't the last slide that's got engine noise on it. So this was... This was, a, uh, this was a test, very simple test. The ethos all the way along with this journey was have an idea and then quickly identify what was the worst that could happen. And if that was acceptable, then get out and go and do it. So this was getting an aluminium tube, bolting an engine to it with some shrouding. That In this particular case, the shrouding was removed because we'd actually done a couple of tests before this. Uh, mop bucket with the fuel tank in it and a little servo controller on the side and, and actually proved a lot. It proved that you could actually hold on to these. It dismissed the assumption that the gyroscopic force of 120,000 RPM uh, turbine spindle wouldn't be manageable. Turned out completely unnoticeable. Um, and same with the heat, um, same with the strength you needed. That single engine which pu was pushing with about 23 kilos of force, uh, but only weighs 1.9 kilos. So it was quite impressive. Now, you know, you could just think that was a fun little exercise of blowing leaves around a lane, or you could go and get another one. Uh, and you've seen, you've seen a little clip of this at the beginning. What you haven't seen is that, apart from me demonstrating that now I've got about 50 kilos of lift, uh, and it doesn't look like I'm slowing, I'm coming down very slowly, but you can certainly feel the difference. What you can really notice is when I try and hold them sideways, you can, you can tell that there's a lot of force going on because I really struggle to hold it. And you can notice in the background as well, there's a, there's a lady trying to do some gardening in that allotment to the back. And clearly didn't enjoy what we were doing. Anyway, in the same spirit of things, again, that was so compelling that we just thought, well, let's go and try four. So now this is 100 kilos of lift, nearly 100 kilos of lift, which sounds impressive because I don't weigh 100 kilos, but you start to also accumulate weight of equipment and fuel. Now, we, we tried a few uh, experiments. That, that's obviously two engines on each arm, which was proving quite, quite good, quite doable. Um, we tried then an engine on each leg. Now, the leg thing, lots of people contact us about this. Uh, I think they probably watched the Iron Man film and thought that's, that's a good idea. You'd think it was a good idea. And it was to a point, but there's this weird thing that because your arms are quite controllable and almost closer to your head, it's like you've got, you seemingly got more control over your arms. The problem with your legs is when you, when you feel like you're falling or you're, you're off the ground, and you can simulate this if you get a dog and hold it above a paddling pool, 
your legs start doing all sorts of weird things trying to find the ground again, which is usually okay, but not when you've got a jet engine attached to them pushing, <laughs> pushing with 22 kilos of thrust. And you'll see there's a clip coming later where this has proved a problem. Also, interestingly, that clip there, I, again, I thought it was a good idea. I, I attached myself to a tether, and I thought well, that's a great alternative to falling over in this concrete farmyard. The problem with that was it became essentially another vector. So if you've got a vector on each arm and one on each leg, you've now got a fifth one between your shoulder blades, which is tugging you in all sorts of weird different directions. It made the problem even worse, uh, which is a shame because we just carried on falling over. This was, a, this was another little experiment. This is now three engines on each arm. That was, that was not manageable. That was more than enough power to take off the ground, but um, it was just an outrageous amount of weight. There was about 12, about 12 kilos on each arm just before you'd do anything. Um, and Yes, about, uh, what, 60 or kilos of thrust. So that was an interesting experiment. Also, you can see I started to put the batteries and the electronics on my shoulders because the swirling around heat was not doing the lithium batteries too much good. They'd sometimes come, uh, come away from a testing session slightly fatter than they went in, which we thought was a bad idea. Um, now, we arrived on this model of two engines on each arm and one on each leg, despite what I just said earlier, and made frustratingly, you know, Frustrating progress in the sense that, I mean, you can see there, see, see what I mean by the leg thing? There's, there's this, this really hard behavior to control. But we persevered and persevered and learned the hard way about how to manage these engines and then did, and this was November, around November 2016, and we, the first standing in a lane with one engine was only in March 2016, all alongside a day job as well. And then we did this. So you can see, I'm fighting my right leg because it's doing something weird. I managed to control the left one for some reason. But you could see that was the first flight. That was six seconds of, of not CGI, no, no tethers or anything. That was genuinely using the brain to balance and six jet engines to fly. From that point onwards, we realized this was, to our utter shock and surprise, actually really quite doable. So it was a question of re refining it from there. And you'll see from uh, some of these clips, I'll let this one play while I talk. This is from the Guinness World Record thing we did in November last year. Um, we made some subtle changes. So in that shot, you can see now I've got one single engine on my back instead of two, which was uh, instead of two on my legs. We, we realized that having them on the legs had all the problems I described earlier, but also, almost more annoyingly, if you took off from any surface, because the air is coming out at 1,000 miles an hour, it tends to destroy anything you stand on. Even concrete, you could watch it chipping away. So that kind of limited our ability to go places. So we moved the two engines from the legs up to your waist, and that worked really well. And then we realized if we consolidate that, those two into one big one here, that one big one was more efficient. Uh, you could dial it up to even more power. And also it, for boring technical reasons, was happier starting vertically. When you had two on your back, at some of the events, I did the original TED Talk event with, uh, like this, you'd have to quietly try and hide around the corner from places if you could and sort of lean over rather embarrassingly to try and get the rear engines to go as horizontal as possible, which wasn't really ideal. So we, we ended up with this system with one big engine on the back and two on each arm. And then you can see here, uh, this is an unusual one. It doesn't look very impressive uh, until you realize this is actually indoors in front of 500 kids for Wired in London. So that's indoors, which is not really to be recommended, I have to say. But it just shows how maneuverable and controllable it is. The nice thing about this, is lots of nice things about it, but one of the nice things about it is that Actually, there's no gyros or ECUs being relied upon to maintain control and stability. Yes, if you lose an engine, it does, really doesn't glide, and I don't want to demonstrate that later. It's always a possibility. Lots of YouTube potential if I fall on my face. Um, but at least the nice thing is that the 1,050 horsepower, yes, 1,050 horsepower, you can just about equate that to thrust, um, that's all under my control. So if I was a complete fool and I just pointed them all down and vectored downwards, I would thunder up to 1,000 feet in not very much time at all. If I was relying on a gyro to avoid that, I would be more nervous than I usually am when I fly this. So it's all down to our innate ability to balance. And it's been quite a surprise that the balance engine in the brain actually is quite so capable. It was part of the original starting hypothesis. You know, and to be clear, despite what people think, I'm, I'm not some genius at balancing. I, I don't ski board, snowboard or ski or rollerblade or anything. I just had the belief that actually to be able to like jog slowly across an uneven field, for instance, was going to require a huge amount of processing ability on this very uneven, unbalanced structure of ours. So if you could re-employ that to fly this, which is actually a very stable triangle of thrust, then it wouldn't be too unmanageable. And it turns out that was the case. I'll get to some interesting shots in a minute that demonstrates that. So since we launched this only March last year, 
Uh, we've done now 48 events in 18 countries, because it turns out you can put it all in two wheelie suitcases and go anywhere in the world. Um, it's great. It's a bit like the early days of drones, where there's no real rules to stop you doing this. I've even had jet engines in my hand luggage, and they scan them, and they all gather around and wonder what it is, and then we have a lovely chat, and I show them a picture, and they can't find it in their book of things you're not allowed to travel with. <laughs> so I just carry on and go through the airport. Um, in fact, ironically, the two things that are most tricky are the, the batteries to start it, to start the engines, um, but that's fine. You know, they, they attract more attention than the engines, really. And, and uh, the drone we often carry. Um, everybody gets very worried about drones, but the 1,000 horsepower jet suit sitting in the suitcases, no one really seems to care about. So it's been a, you know, a, a privilege and a pleasure to fly around the world uh, in every sense. Uh, and we've done, I've done our four TED Talks, including the main one in Vancouver. And just before then, the picture up the top right-hand corner there is Tim Draper from San Francisco. I dropped into the, their VC open day. They invited me just to come and do a very first flight. I treated it as a warm-up before the terrifying one at TED, where if I'd fallen on my face there, that would have been tr tricky. Um, I did that flight in that car park, and then he wrote me a $650,000 deal for 10% of the company I'd just formed a month earlier. Uh, and he wrote that on a banknote and handed it to me in the car park. And you can see I'm still wearing the flight kit. So that, that was my VC round in a car park. It's been a very unusual year. So we, we've been all over the place. Uh, and I've just slotted in two other shots from last week because I only got off a plane from LA 48 hours ago. So for a bit of a laugh, we did that. That was quite fun. Um, you can obviously spot the sign in the background. And then there's a really nice shot of uh, some fun we had over Malibu Beach as well. This is a 360 shot. It looks like a sort of strange cannonball with little legs. But um, for those of you who know, that is actually me. But that was great fun. That was, that was kind of sunset over Malibu Beach, like dodging around the kite surfers, who we did talk to beforehand, so they didn't kind of die of shock. But it shows you, for, for people who are kind of concerned about how this works, we can go into more detail if you catch me later, but it's not pushing off the ground. It doesn't care what's on the ground apart from kicking dust up. It's actually easier flying higher up. It's, it doesn't rely on any you know, constant surface of any kind. Uh, now, part of the business model out of this, which is all sort of been built up since we realized this works so well, uh, is actually we've trained people now to fly this, so clients of ours turn up and uh, go to our flight training hangar, which you get little snippets of in this film, and in a safe, tethered way, uh, you can learn to fly. And we've had two of our team, one of whom is here today, uh, he, he's learned to fly this in 15 minutes, cumulatively, over you know six, seven goes. And the record so far is a 20-year-old kind of amateur gymnast. The gymnast thing just helps because two things, really. He's not short of shoulder strength, so he, when he's learning, he doesn't get tired quickly, which is, you know, can be an issue. But the other thing is, I think gymnasts and people who do any kind of sport where they spend time in the air, it's that, thing, that leg thing again to a degree, when, if, they're, if they're calm when they're in the air tumbling or jumping some snowboard or something, I think that kind of helps. Because fundamentally, the physics is really simple. And he's learned in three goes less than five minutes. I had him on a tether for the first two goes, and it got boring because he never fell. So I took him off the tether, and he just flew around happily in three goes in less than five minutes. It's frankly a surprise to me. So we, we train people to fly these. We even sold one of these for a quarter million dollars last year. And actually, next week, we're launching this in Selfridges in London. There's going to be a suit sitting there and a VR flight experience there. We built a VR simulation of this to show you the whole vectoring thing. Um, and that's, as I say, that's, that's part of the um, kind of higher-end business model of this. But also, what's really, really fun is I guess because this is slightly unusual, we ended up, we've ended up becoming a bit of a magnet for interesting, I suppose, interesting people and interesting technologies. So actually, at your event earlier in, in Munich, when was it, in January? January, yes, there's been a lot of events. Um, we actually, as a good example, uh, EOS, who make a lot of the 3D printing, uh, metal printing, uh, particularly metal printing machines, uh, are a good example. They approached us, and, and we've now got a collaboration with them, thanks to your event, actually. But we have loads of this going on all over the place, and... We do things like this. This was actually GE who did these ones. These are titanium prints of the arm assembly. So we need them very lightweight and custom built, if you like, to fit your arm and the engines. Um, so we hugely employ both polymer and metal printing across the whole suit. I fly with a holographic heads-up display system. And it, I mean, that all sounds very fun. But it's actually quite useful, because as I'm flying along, consuming nearly a gallon a minute, so what for? I'm in America mode, four liters a minute, uh, which is a lot then I really need to know where I am with the fuel, and I need to know where I am with all the engine startup data and things like that. And that's all just painted across my vision. And really, if you think about it, how else would you do it? Because you couldn't exactly put it on a dial on your wrist, because that would, that would be a bad thing. So it, it, what I'm trying to say is it's a really fun opportunity to just go and showcase loads of great technology all over the place. Now, 
where's all this going? Well, I'm just giving it away. So what we'd really like to do is accelerate this technology. We seem to have opened a door accidentally onto a whole new potential realm of human mobility. Yes, it's ridiculously inefficient, noisy, and as you'll see later, pretty crazy. But then the first motor cars were considered to be inefficient and no one really saw the potential of them. So just maybe, and this is, this is a conversation that's, that works really well in last week in California, where they, ha they have this big grand vision with everything you present to them. There's two pilots flying by there, that's Angelo who's with me here. Um, this could well be the first rung on a whole new way of moving human beings around. It's going to need a lot of development, and we're already working on the electric version of this, which to our surprise we've managed to get working. It's a challenge with the energy density. But to accelerate the journey to that, there's two ways, <laughs> I'll just be controversial, there's two ways of moving technology really quick. You have a war, that really works, but we won't do that. Or you go racing stuff. As soon as you get competitive over things, and Formula One's a good example of that, things move really quickly. So we're actually building out a race series for next year with um, our backers in California particularly. Because I quite fancy the idea of having, I don't know, five, six guys and girls from different backgrounds, from um, uh, everything from rock climbing to dirt bike racing to gymnastics, all coming from those different backgrounds, learning this, frankly, in probably 10 minutes, and then go racing. And we can start adapting each system to suit the pilot and really start exploring the boundaries. Because I'm pretty sure we'll find out. I've been flying these very conservatively. I know you saw the jet ski footage just early on. That's really only scraping the surface. These things are ridiculously maneuverable and ridiculously quick. So that's really the goal that we're working towards for next year. It's all happened pretty quick, as I say. We only really launched this whole business only 14 months ago. So I'd like to kind of close, I suppose, by saying that if you take a step back from everything, all of these plans and visions and things like that, if nothing else, and speaking as somebody who came from 16 years in a big corporate background, this is a really good example, I think, of just sometimes if you have that big vision, that big idea, if you can identify really quickly what the first thing is that you can do to go and start making it real. So in our case, stick in your arm in an aluminum tube and make sure all the time, every risk you take, because it's going to involve risk of all sorts, as long as that downside is manageable and acceptable, you really can go and create something that you never imagined was possible. Thank you very much.